couple of passages, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, Galatians 6, 1 through 5. I'm going to read both of those. I remind you, we are continuing to study through uh, this theme of one anothering, living in a gospel community. In other words, in encountering those passages in the Scripture where we're taught how to relate to one another. I just want to remind you real quickly of where we have been in this study. You, uh, we looked at, first of all, Jesus commands us to love one another. Then we looked at the love of God as the motivation to love one another. Then loving one another as friends of Jesus. We looked at two installments of loving one another as evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. Then loving one another with a family affection. Two installments with that. Loving one another as fulfillment of the law. We're going to see that referenced in our text today. Serving one another through love. Encouraging and edifying one another. Bearing with one another. Confessing sin and praying for one another. Two times. Forgiving one another. In the last two Sundays, cultivating a welcoming culture toward one another, what we call uh, harmony and hospitality. And today we're going to look at bearing one another's burdens, bearing with one another from a little different angle than we looked before under that, bearing one another's burdens. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, and Galatians 6, 1 to 5. If you would stand with me. <clears throat> We do this uh, demonstrating a measure of honor for God's Word. Following along in your Bibles, if your Bible with you, we've got the text on the screen for you so you can see it as well as hear it. First of all, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's the uh, Ephesians passage. The Galatians passage says it this way. Galatians 6, 1 to 5. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And these texts will teach us today, if we'll be open to them, that, that compassion, love, Concern for one another should be the first response we give to each other. Sometimes sadly that's not the case. But the scripture makes it very plain. That if we've been saved by grace, placed into a, a situation with others saved by grace, then we should be ready, willing, and strengthened by the scripture in the spirit to be enabled to bear one another's burdens. Thank you. Please be seated. In this, these two passages, I want us to see two things today. From the Ephesians passage, look at bearing one another's burden out of love. It's one of the, there's two motivations here. The first one is out of love. 
than the Galatians passage, bearing one another's burden out of obedience to the law of Christ. And we need both of those. Because sometimes we're not feeling loving. And so we, ch we respond to the Scripture's teaching. We need both of those because sometimes we can, we can do things out of just a bare, essential obedience, but not heartfelt. And the church functions best when we do what we do to the glory of God out of a loving obedience to our Savior. So I want us to, to see these two things today. First of all, bearing one another's burdens out of love in Ephesians. Paul describes himself. He's a prisoner of the Lord. Now what he means is he was, he was in chains, he was in prison, but he realizes he's there to glorify God. He's there to reflect Jesus Christ. He is the one who will teach the church at Rome that, that God is working all things together for good to those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. And he's doing this that we might be increasingly conformed to the image of Christ. That, that when life squeezes us, that more and more the aroma of Jesus Christ would come out of that experience. And the people would be struck with that. The people would, as stated elsewhere, in such a situation, be constrained to ask us, tell me the reason for the hope that you have in you today. And so there's this, he's a prisoner of, of the Lord. And he's giving an exhortation here. He's urging them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. For Paul to say that means that there, there is a way to walk that is walking in a manner to to show that, that you may be unworthy of being identified as a Christian. Now look, we're all unworthy of being saved. But when we are saved by grace through faith, placed into the family of God, the Holy Spirit implanted in us by the new birth to, to work out uh, the will of God, making us to will and to do of His good pleasure, there is a way we should live. That's what walk means. And when we are not doing that, when that is not a predominant expression in our lives, then we are saying we're not worthy to be called a Christian. We're, we're bringing reproach. You, you and I, we, we all know people who would name the name of Christ, who would point back to a, a baptism experience if they're Baptist, and yet they're not li no more living for Jesus Christ today than they are ambassadors from Mars. It's just not there. And that's, that's called that's, that's unworthy. Walking in an unworthy manner. So Paul says, I'm challenging you to walk in a way that reflects that Jesus' death for you and your receiving of that does not appear to have been in vain. And then he gives these, these spiritual qualities that ought to manifest it with all humility, gentleness, patience. Uh, some of your some of your translations may say forbearance next, and that's the that's the word that when you unpack it speaks to bearing with one another in love, and then striving for unity. The humility uh, there it's, a, it's an attitude born of a proper estimate of self. He's gonna he's gonna address that again in Galatians. It's designed to make us recognize that as made in the image of God, we are dependent upon God. If I'm aware that in the scheme of God's vast, expansive universe, that I am a small, small, small part of that, then it will check me keep me from thinking more of myself than I should. It will, it will remind me that, that my salvation is not merited. Not one subatomic particle in me can, can be uh, ascribed to, assigned to, the reason for me being saved. And that works out of humility in us. 
gentleness is an attitude of, of kindness toward others in submission to God. We've told you over and over through the years, the Ten Commandments, the two tables of stone and the Ten Commandments speak in the first table of our duty to God, how we are to love God, relate to God, submit to God. The second table of our duty to one another, to our fellow man. How we are to relate to one another. How we are to love one another. Gentleness manifests that. It's called meekness elsewhere. The word meek, you know from studies in the past, is a is a word in the is a word in the in the Greek world of strength under harness. It it was the it was the getting a bit into a horse's mouth to guide him and control him. When you get when you break a horse, which would be a, a popular language in Oklahoma, in Texas. Uh, you haven't broken the spirit of that heart. It doesn't. It doesn't sit over in the corner pouting. Strong animal. But you've brought it its strength under harness. And so that's what we're looking at in in this gentleness. It's a mild disposition, a patient disposition, able to restrain itself. And that doesn't come naturally. Supernatural work of the Lord. The next, the next term is, is patience. This is this word is the is best described as the opposite of being short tempered. Or blowing your stack, if you please. It's the it's the working out of what James teaches in James chapter one of being slow to anger. Cultivated in a person who will bear injury and insult and not begin to plot how to retaliate. It's the person who walks out to his vehicle and goes and tears the bumper sticker off the back of his car that says, I don't get mad, I get even. Slow to anger. And then this word that, that we're focusing on today, forbearing, or bearing with one another. Being long suffering, uh, putting up with. You know, God says to the prophet in the Old Testament, how, how long shall I put up with you? Jesus says in the New Testament, How long have I been with you? You're so slow of heart. But it's, it's, a, it's a bearing with. It's a person who will make allowance for the faults of fellow believers. They don't play the gotcha game. They're not looking to see a person stumble. They're not going to be the first to point it out and first to spread the news. Did you hear what happened to so-and-so? Bearing with people in their weaknesses and failings. And what drives this bearing one another is love. Love. Agape love. I've been loved by God. This is a brother or sister in Christ here. I need to show the love that God has shown to me to them. For a couple of reasons. First is so that they will be reminded of the love that God has for them. When we get into Galatians 6, it's more obvious. He's talking about someone who's who has been ensnared in sin. But when weakness, not if, when weakness is manifested in the life of a fellow believer, at that very moment we have an opportunity either to judge them, to scorn them, to express our strong disapproval of them, or to love them. Now you know good and well. We're not talking about a maudlin sentimentality. We're not talking about burying our head in the sand to pretend it's not happening. You've been, we've been together long enough to know that when we take those steps 
And in the case of Galatians, the erring brother or sister refuses to be recovered then at some point in the process, the most loving thing you can do is to excommunicate them from the body. It comes to that. This is dealing with what we might call the first response that believers have to other professing fellow believers when weakness is manifest. And it could be a weakness in the area of them just crumbling under the load of pressure. I would submit to you that our, our brother, Pastor Joseph, is under an incredible load. When you read Paul in the Scriptures, and he talks about how, how he, is, he is aching for those churches that he helped birth. Pastor Joseph is stretched right now with two good things. One is caring for his brother. His brother has the form of cancer, glioblastoma, that my sister Joy had. And I pray it will not be for him what it was for her. It was a death sentence for her. Almost a year to the day that she was diagnosed with it, she died. From it. It's a horrific death. So, Brother Norman, imagine an octopus being in your brain and its tentacles running everywhere. When they did surgery on her to open the brain up, they said, we cannot, we can't remove it. Their fingerlings run all through your brain. And as that happens, then various brain functions begin to be captured by that. It's an excruciatingly painful death to experience and to watch if you're the loved one, like my brother-in-law had to watch. This is what Mago is dealing with, brother Pastor Joseph is torn in the, in, the, in the right care of his brother in a country where he has no one caring for him with the very difficult prospect of even being, be, even being able to return his brother to Haiti. And then he has the burden of all the churches of the Haiti Collective where he cannot personally be there to encourage the pastors. There's this we see that, and I think it's right and proper for us to send, as, as he's always calling us when we go down there, his missionaries, to send Norman and Linda as our missionaries to him, to care for him. Give that ministry of presence, of being there, tangible, undeniable proof. We love you. We're caring for you. And so there's this, there's this bearing of the burden. Paul calls us to this. We do it in love. It's how we show that we're family. Each of you has a family, comes from a family. You may be at a point of exasperation with various members of your family, but you can go back and trace back when that began. And probably there was not the immediate response of get out of this family for either the purpose of disappointing and embarrassing the family or your struggles are a drag on this family. No, that's not the first response. And so this this bearing with one another in love, one writer says, suggests the attitude that seeks the highest good of others. We can say to one another, we, we really pray for your well-being. We, we, we say to them, God bless you. We pray God will bless you. But it's in, the, it's in the press when we see them stumble under the load that we then demonstrate whether or not we really want to see that happen in their lives. The blessing of God. The goodness of God. If we're willing to get ourselves under that load with them. demonstrates whether or not we really love them unconditionally. Our love was only tied to their conduct. And once conduct goes sideways, then we put our love back in our pocket. It's, it's in these situations that we get to demonstrate that we have been shown agape love and we are learning how to show agape love. 
to love one another, to bear with one another. And so that's the picture we get from, from Ephesians. It's The motivation is love. I've been loved by Christ. I'm a horrible sinner. I'm a great sinner. The apostle who wrote this said, I'm the chief of sinners. Because I have been loved such, I must show love to others. And that happens in bearing one another's burdens. I want you to look secondly at Galatians. To bear one another's burdens out of obedience. Verses 1 to 5, it says, If anyone is caught in any transgression, see if he just said if anyone is caught in some transgressions, then we could, we could make a list of some transgressions to which this doesn't apply. In any transgression. The picture here of caught, the word used, can either mean ensnared or it can mean what we see happen in the Gospels where, where the Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman who said she was caught in the very act. So either ensnared or discovered. It says if, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. Now he's not creating a category like has been done in Christianity in this country. Well, well, he's a, he's a spiritual Christian. I'm I'm not a spiritual Christian. I'm a carnal Christian. As an excuse to to just kind of float along in life and, and not engage in aggressive sanctification. That's not what he's saying here. He's taking this word from from Galatians where he's talked about he's contrasted the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. You who are walking in the Spirit. You who are keeping in step with the Spirit. You who are continually being filled with the Spirit as he teaches in Ephesians. That's a spiritual person. A spiritual person is a follower of Christ who is practicing the means of grace knowing that he was saved to glorify God by increasingly being conformed to the image of God. That means that no matter how long you or I have been Christians, we never get to a point of satisfaction to say, well, boy, that sanctification was really challenging. No, no, no. You know how, you know how I can prove to you that sanctification is still needed? You're still breathing this air. When faith gives way to sight and glory, then we can put to rest progressive sanctification, continuing sanctification. And so this is who he's appealing to. When you when you find <clears throat> excuse me, when you find in your midst one of your own who is either ensnared or discovered. In any transgression, little, huge, the first response, the people in the church who will be, be the first responders, if you please, should assume, commit to restoring. Now, too many churches have a history of of shooting their wounded. And their carcasses are scattered all over the landscape. And that's why sometimes people say, I'm, no thank you, I'm not, I'm, not going, I'm not coming to your church, not coming to anybody's church, because I know what happened to a person who was in church in this one, and man, that's not the first response. Redemptive, Corrective church discipline does undertake, as, as Matthew 18 suggests and 1 Corinthians 5 instructs, that you go and win. And this is, the, this is what Paul is talking about. You restore. You should restore him. Attempt to restore him or her in a spirit of gentleness. There's that word again that was, was there in Ephesians. It's not harshness. How could you do this? How dare you? That attitude 
thank God, Jesus does not manifest to us. When we sin, if we, if we have the Holy Spirit living in us, then the Holy Spirit is grieved by our sin. And He in turn grieves us, producing in us a godly sorrow, a real repentance, setting us up to experience the hallmark of the gospel, and that is forgiveness. Because He, dwelling in us, reminds us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the Scripture teaches that if we confess our faults one to another, we've looked at that, but there's a healing that takes place. Sometimes there's a, there's a sin sickness. There's a, there's a sin that is so rampant, so pervasive, that it actually has a, a debilitating effect upon our very lives, our very existence. But sin also damages relationships. And so he is, he is telling us that the, the attitude, if it's to be done in love, if that's the motivation, we look in, in Ephesians, then it, it needs to be manifested with a gentleness, a strength that is harnessed for the glory of God not to banish someone who has been ensnared or discovered in sin, but to attempt to recover them to their own spiritual well-being and to the to the vitality in the body of Christ. And then he gives this, this warning. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. I told you before, but the enemy of our souls is not all-powerful, like our God is all-powerful. And he's not even hugely creative. You can, you can spot his modus operandi. But here's one of the things he inevitably does. If he cannot get the people of God to undertake in an evangelical gospel spirit to rescue those who've been ensnared or discovered, then he will use the fact of someone's falling, someone's failure, to tempt the person who has concern to themselves yield to temptation. Here's how it goes. Either they get entangled in an attempt to recover the erring one, or they, they look at the erring one, and if it doesn't seem to be a big deal, because see, what would, what would a big deal look like to most people? Well, you pounce. When the church doesn't pounce, but the church pleads and tries to rescue, then, then the enemy of our soul says, see there? Man, they, they, call, they, they drop that plumb line. You need to walk according to this standard. And yet when somebody doesn't, turn a blind eye. A deaf ear. Let me tell you something. Churches that do not practice redemptive, corrective church discipline are setting up their own members to fail and to be ensnared. I promise you that's what the enemy of our souls is whispering to tender-hearted Christians who may be wounded by this, that they talk a good game. Bottom line is it just doesn't matter. And so Paul is Paul's anticipating this. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. What, what happens typically, particularly if you're engaged in a, an attempt to recover someone from scandalous sin, what happens? You've experienced this. The enemy of your souls whispers, who are you to go to them? Who are you? You're not perfect. And when those kind of thoughts come to your mind, I promise you, that's not the Holy Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit of God is concerned for the glory of God in your life and the life of the person who needs to be rescued. That is coming from the enemy of your soul because he would like to paralyze you to do nothing. Forty-five years of ministry, I've heard this excuse from people numerous times. 
Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. He does not say, don't engage or endeavor unless you've completely got your act together. He doesn't say that. Just keep watch. Be, be aware of the temptation. Two ditches. devil doesn't care which one he pushes you in. Walk the path. And then he gets to the meat of the matter. Bear one another's burdens. This, this is what burden bearing is going to look like. One among you has stumbled. One among you has, has fallen. One among you has been ensnared in sin. They've been caught in sin. Get under the load. This is burden bearing. And so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Well, summarize, it's the law of love. But you don't say that and then play that against the Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments teach us the summary of what it means to love God with our total being and to love, love our neighbor, love one another as ourselves. The law of Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And when we began this study in John 13, we looked at Jesus saying, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. Well, in this context here, well, remember that he had taught, if you have a hundred sheep and one goes missing, you go after the one to bring them back into the fold. You do not think like, like modern, uh, some modern ministers think, well, 99 out of 100 is not a bad number. We're not allowed to think that like that. And so he who said, if you... If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll love one another as I've loved you. We fulfill that. We obey that. So let's be honest. It may be a situation where you, where you have gone after a person time and time and time again. And you say, I'm tired. There's wasting my time, wasting their time, nothing good is being accomplished. And that's, it's good then to remind yourselves, how often, Master, how often should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Up to seven times. I've taught you that when Peter said that, he really, he really thought he was, was, was stretching himself. Because the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders had sort of a three-strike rule. They didn't know anything about baseball, but you got three, time, three opportunities. And if it happened the fourth time, that was it. So Peter's going... Two times three plus one. Seven is a perfect number. Seven times? Jesus said, no, not seven times. Seventy times seven. He uses some math there. In other words, just keep, you're not close, Peter. Keep, keep multiplying it out. It's a lot bigger than you think. A lot more often than you think. And so, so there may be that experience and you think, you know, I've, I've been engaged in this. Lovingly, out of love. And I didn't see any promising effects from it. Any fruit from it. And so you come along and here and you're taught, well, the fruit of it is, whether you see any results in the individual you desire, the fruit of it is the fruit of obedience in your life. You fulfill the law of Christ. It may be the burden of sin. He starts out the passage. But, it's, but it can be any difficulty. Because remember, it's about one anothering. And so when one member struggles and suffers, there's a sense in which we all do. We pray for the persecuted church, we're taught, to pray for them who are in prison as if you're chained next to them. You see that picture there? We're to, we're to have sympathy. We're to have empathy. We're to have compassion. Bear one another's burdens. That word there is a, is a heavy load, a heavy weight, a crushing weight. Now, I say that to you because when you get to verse 5, we, we looked at this when we went through Galatians some time ago, that some of the passages, some of the, some of the translations teach, for each one must bear his own burden. It's a different word. The ESV makes the distinction, for each one will have to bear his own load. The word here in, in verse 2 is the crushing weight that may be relationships in trouble. 
It may be employment difficulties. It may be financial hardship. It may be physical debilitation. It may be spiritual depression. It may be mental weariness. It can be any of those things. It may be a discouragement. It may be that this person has, has begun to neglect the means of grace. And when that happens, I promise you, you can mark it down. When, when we neglect the means of grace designed to build us up and strengthen us. And we went through that when we did our spiritual discipline study on Sunday nights. That the enemy of our souls, who knows we're sheep, that our safety is in the flock, that's where the shepherd is, begins to move us apart, begins to cull us, just ease us away. Subtle. Get you away. Get you away from your commitment to the church. Get you away from the joy that you have in the fellowship. Get you away from being with them when they meet. Do that subtly. He doesn't, he doesn't grab you by the neck and drag you away. It's just a subtle nudge, subtle nudge, subtle nudge. And then say, these people don't care anything about you. If they cared about you, they would let you know it concerns them that you're moving away. It's a lie of the devil. It's a lie of the devil. And so we've got, we've got to be wise about this. Get under that load. And then he gives this warning. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. What's he talking about there? He's talking about an attitude that could manifest itself when someone does fall again, when someone does engage in scandalous sin, and the response is not that of compassion and of love that we looked at earlier, but it's one of a how could you? How dare you? I would never do that. The scripture warns about that. Let the one who thinks he stands straight and tall take heed, be careful, lest he stumble. So Paul's teaching here, don't, don't think yourself better than someone else who may have been ensnared in sin or discovered in sin. Don't think, it's a, a very Jewish way of thinking, if you see people with great difficulty and you conclude, well, there's a reason God's not blessing them. Or it's not even just Jewish, it's charismatic. Tell you what, something's wrong. Because God intends to bless you. Paul doesn't know any of that nonsense. He's teaching them, remember you too are a sinner saved by grace. I had a fellow say to me years ago, and I just, I, I should have known better. He said, well, you know, he was talking about his, his terrible upbringing. First time he ever attended worship, he was, he was freshman in college. I, on the other hand, as I've told you, I had a, had a godly mother who, who lovingly, tenaciously, persistently dragged me uh, the block and a half or two that it took to get to the church building when I didn't want to go. Um, he said, well, it, he said, it didn't take as much grace to save you as it did me. I said, oh, you're wrong. That's what I told him. I said, in fact, I was saved from the most deadly and dangerous drug that's ever been manufactured. Dead religion. Dead religion. No, you see, Paul says, take a right estimation of yourself. It takes as much grace to save you as it does the worst person you've ever known about. Because we're all dead in trespasses and sins. That's what he's, if he thinks he's something, if the, if the difficulty of others, if the, if the sinfulness of others has the result of you saying, hmm, boy, howdy. I thank you, Father, that I'm not like this fellow. Prayer of the Pharisee. Paul says you need to be careful. When he's nothing, you're deceiving yourself. And that self-deception is setting yourself up. Because why do you think the devil takes the time to invade a congregation and go after young believers, weak believers, wounded believers, to take them down? Josh will tell you, he'll tell you if he was here, they had 
chickens at one time. And the foxes took them all out one by one. You see, a fox never is content to get one chicken and say, Phew, you got the chicken. No. The fact that you get a chicken successfully means what? There are more chickens for the taking. That's what the devil is doing. When he comes after one of us, it's because he intends to come after all of us. And so Paul is warning here. Don't be self-deceived. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. In other words, check, check how you are living. When, when someone among us is ensnared in sin, when someone among us is caught in sin, when someone among us is under the great press, Ask yourself, am I, am I guarding my own heart? Because that could happen to me too. That's the examination he expects. He says his, his boast will be in himself alone, not look what I did, but thank you, Lord, that your spirit is keeping me stirred to the means of grace and not in his neighbor. Why would he boast in his neighbor? He wouldn't boast that his neighbor had fallen. He would boast, look how my neighbor has fallen. I hadn't done that. I'd never do that. Paul understands. And then he gives this, each one will have to bear his own load. That word there is a different word from verse 2. And it, it was actually literally used for the soldier's knapsack. That there are expectations that we all have in life that God has of us. That we should, we should carry our own load. See, verse 2 is not an excuse to be lazy, complacent, neglectful of the means of grace, and expect everybody else just to clean up your messes after you. Expect everybody else to do it for you. I cannot live the Christian life for you. And you cannot live the Christian life for anyone else. There are daily cares, daily responsibilities, daily commands. In this passage, obey the law of Christ, show love to one another, bear one another's burdens that are our responsibility. Those are, those are our daily loads. That's what's in our knapsack, if you please, our gospel knapsack, that we carry with us, and we don't pass them off on anybody else. No one else can take your place in prayer meeting. No one else can take your place in daily devotions for you, praying for others. No one else can take your place in you loving as the Lord intends for you to love. No one else can do that. There is no proxy arrangement in the Christian life. Everyone accountable for himself, herself. That's what Paul's teaching here. And it's one of the most compassionate commitments a congregation can make to say to somebody, I've got your back. We've got your back. We will do our best under heaven to throw a blanket of love over you, to not exploit your faults, your failings. We will provoke you. We're going to look at that passage in the near future. Provoke you to love and good works. Be an encouragement to you as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4. Use these words to encourage or comfort one another. We're going to use the Scripture. The reminder of Jesus Christ. was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, who was tempted in every way. The temptation you have faced and failed in, Jesus was tempted that way. He did not sin. You have a Savior, Scripture tells us, who understands your infirmities, who understands your weakness, who feels them. That's the word. And no temptation has come to you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. And we'll make a way through it. It's the reminder of the gospel. We love you. We don't look down our noses at you. You haven't disappointed us to the point where we go washing our hands of you. We're in this together. We're one another in, in this community. And I promise you folks, that kind of a climate kind of a commitment where I, where I don't think about 
me, my, and mine primarily transforms culture. And you, you pass people every day who are aching inside. They are so lonely. And some have been so hurt in church settings. But if God would help us if we would commit ourselves to this, this could become an oasis. An oasis in a desert. This could be a place where, where folks come and heal from being used and abused. A place where, where they, they, quote, take a chance on the gospel being true and real and discover that it really is. That it does transform life. That it does cultivate in people an, a Jesus-centeredness and an other-interestedness. one another. And you see, the best community, the best churches engage in one another. Burden bearing. Loving. Rejoicing with. Receiving into family. And when that doesn't happen, when we give the impression that you're too much of a load on us, then we have not only not fulfilled the law of Christ, we have rejected the law of Christ. And when He says to you, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, that should burn in our conscience. We pray for one another. That's one of the ways you bear one another's burdens. You find out about it, you get under the load. You pray with them. Stop them. How are you doing? Man, I'm struggling. Let's pray about that. Bethel Baptist Church has an opportunity this week to say very tangibly, Pastor Joseph, we love you. We know that you are under an incredible load. You are torn. And neither situation is easy. Well, we sent two of our missionaries to you to say to you, we love you. We're under this load with you. You're not going this alone. The body of Christ is with you. Oh, that that would be just the warp and woo. The rhythm, the rhythm of ministry. How powerful that would be. Let's pray. Your Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.